Good morning. Welcome to Westbridge Church. My name's Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here. It's so great to have you with us today. I want to say hello to everybody joining us online. Thanks for participating through that venue. Uh, if you're sitting in our cafe, so glad you're joining us. And uh, if you're in a parent viewing room, that's a great option. If you have small kids that you prefer to keep with you during the service, thanks for using those rooms as well. And uh, I want to remind you that if you haven't downloaded the Westbridge Church app, it's the best way to learn a lot of information about the church. One of the things that we've added to the Westbridge Church app is a resource tab. And specifically during this series, when you click into resources, you can click on this series and you can find all kinds of resources that deal with a lot of the topics we've been talking about throughout this series, uh, including what we're talking about today and how do I talk to when my preschoolers ask about it, when my elementary kids ask about it, when my middle school or high school kids ask about it, what are some things and resources that I can use to have these conversations with my kids? And so all of that's included as well as a whole bunch of other topics. So feel free to check that out, download that app if you haven't. And uh, reminder, this is a really a one big discussion that's kind of broken into four parts. And so we're in part three of this series uh, called God and Sexuality. And uh, we tend to separate those two things. That's why we really felt the need to do this series because we tend to separate God and sexuality. We think of God as spiritual, sexuality as, uh, as physical. And because we've separated those things in our culture, it's led to a lot of hurt and confusion and brokenness and pain. And uh, the reality is we end up in our culture with a whole lot of ideas and not a whole lot of wisdom. And today's subject matter is not something that I've ever spoken on before. I've been a pastor for 28 years, and I have never talked about this. And it's, yet, it's being discussed by 100% of the population. And so today, we're going to deal with some of the questions surrounding gender dysphoria and transgender people. Now, if this is your very first time at Westbridge Church, I'm so glad you're here. You picked a doozy. I want to uh, just put on the screen for us today, this is a list of all of the resources and the classes that I took in college and all of the books that they gave us when I was in Bible college around this topic. So this is everything I went through. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah, the nothing. That's it. Uh, so uh, at the same time, uh, I'm telling you, I have probably put 60 to 70 hours of work just into this talk alone for this weekend. I've been preparing this for weeks and weeks and weeks and talking to people and reading things and listening to things. And uh, we've got to talk about it because it's highly relevant to all of our lives. And right now we're living in a cultural moment where lots of questions are being asked about what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? And these are questions that are being asked that haven't been asked in human history, particularly on this scale. And so uh, this is the first time in human history that as a culture that we have taken sex from an activity, something that you do, to your identity, who you are. This is the first time that a culture has said, this isn't just something you do, this is now who you are and shaped it into your identity. So first, let me begin by saying that since we sent out a mailer just a few weeks ago, uh, on our mailer it says this, what does the Bible say or what does God say about transgenderism? And since we sent that out, I've, I've been told that's a derogatory term. And I understand that. And I have actually stopped using the term transgenderism and started saying transgender people. Because I never want to reduce this down to just a topic that's out there somewhere. We must remember when we discuss this subject matter, we are talking about people created in the image of God. That's important. And so I'm going to ask you, no matter what happens, no matter what we say today, if there's something that you agree with, hold your applause out of respect for people who may not see things the way that you see things. And this is an incredibly complex, and nuanced, and layered conversation, and it's possible that you are personally walking through this, or someone you know is walking through this. So this is a good time to be reminded of the words of Peter that he wrote to followers of Jesus living in the first century. Peter wrote this. He said, if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But this is my favorite part. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Do this with gentleness and respect. That's really key. And when it comes to this topic, there are some pastors or churches who just refuse to address it. And their whole approach is just bury your head in the sand and ignore it. And I don't think that works. And then there is the other side of the spectrum where there are pastors and churches who will address it, but they don't do it with gentleness or respect. And unfortunately, it's often those with the loudest voices who tend to be the most abrasive and divisive. And so please hear me. Even if you don't agree with my content, I hope that you will trust my heart. 
My heart is to help and not to harm. And I know some of you are very nervous right now because you're not used to having a conversation around such controversial topics and doing it in a constructive manner. You haven't seen it done well in a setting like this. And the reality is we live in a very politically charged environment. But if we're going to have a sincere and honest conversation around this topic today, then we've got to remove our political lenses and we've got to just talk about people, just real people. Our motivation, our desire is to bring hope and healing to real people. Now, as we begin, I just want you to imagine for a second that you are a teenager and you've never felt like you fit the typical stereotype of your biological sex. And as a result, you always feel awkward and out of place. Uh, you were born a boy, but you never really got into WWF or monster trucks or football. You were born a girl, but you never got into American Girl dolls or dress up. In fact, you prefer to be out in the backyard, bouncing on the trampoline with your brothers, throwing a football with friends. And as you grow in adolescence, you wonder what these feelings are that you're experiencing, and you are afraid to vocalize it, and you wonder when they're going to change and if they're going to change, and they just never did. And you're not trying to make a political statement. You're not trying to start a movement. You're not trying to get other people to be like you. You just want to experience peace and happiness in your own body. And then you stumble across a TikTok video, and a peer is announcing that they're going to start going by a different set of pronouns or that they are going to transition and, and they're going to change their gender. And you see how they're celebrated and they're applauded and they seem to be so happy and this thought crosses your mind for the very first time, maybe that's what I should do. Maybe that's the answer. And so it's very personal in here today for any parent of a young teenager who has ever come to them. Maybe you've had a teenager come to you and they tell you that they don't feel at home in the body they were born in and they want to change the name that you gave them and change their appearance and change their pronoun. You love your child and you want what's best for them and so you start to research this and you discover that your child is struggling with something called gender dysphoria, a term that you didn't even know existed a few years ago. And your heart sinks as you read or you are told by someone that kids wrestling with this are at higher risk of suicidal thoughts and ideation. And in online forums, you're confused because you're counseled that to be a supportive parent, which means anything short of fully affirming their decision, could lead them to suicide. And you hear this phrase for the very first time. You can either have a trans son or a dead daughter, and it cuts you right to the heart. This subject is personal today for grandparents who picked up their grandchild from elementary school and, and their grandchild is sitting in the back seat of the car and says that they've been given a gender wheel to help them navigate what gender they want to be when they grow up. This subject is very personal for so many who are school teachers and counselors who are followers of Jesus, who are administrators and business owners who are followers of Jesus, who are leading in the public sector trying to navigate this subject well, as you balance theological beliefs and convictions with public policy and employment law. And you're trying to navigate all that and balance all of those things. Now, I think the place that we've got to begin is with some definitions. Because for many of us, we've had to learn a lot of new terms in recent years, and we're still learning them. So first, let's define sex, which is confusing in our current cultural moment. So here's the definition of sex. Male or female in reference to chromosomes, the way that we determine if a child is male or female is by their chromosomes, by their internal reproductive anatomy and external genitals. When someone is born, their sex is not assigned, it is defined at birth. When a baby is born, genetically, every cell in their body is marked by God either XX chromosomes or XY chromosomes. Every single organ, every body part, your brain, your muscles, lungs, heart, every cell in your body, right down to the molecular level, have a sex assigned by God. No matter what hormone treatment you do, no matter what body parts you alter, you can't change that. Now, within the last couple of decades, there's been a shift in language, and what we've done is we've separated. These terms used to be synonymous, sex and gender. What is your sex? What is your gender? They were synonymous. We used them interchangeably. That is not the case anymore. And you can hem and haw about that all you want to and say, I don't like that. It shouldn't be that way. But the reality is, in every culture, in every era in human history, language evolves. And we start to use terms differently. And so if we're going to have an honest conversation about it, we just have to accept that this has evolved. It's changed. 
And we've separated the concept of sex from the concept of gender, which leads us to this next definition, which is gender identity. A person's self-perception, whether they are male or female, masculine or feminine. So gender identity is the way they see themselves regardless of the biological sex that they were born. This is the idea that sex might be declared by a doctor at birth, but gender is fluid. And it isn't based on chromosomes, and it isn't based on biology. It is based on the self-perception and what someone declares themselves to be, their feelings. Which leads us to our next term, gender fluidity. Gender fluidity is when a person embraces an adaptable nature to the concept of gender identity and gender expression. So they're embracing an adaptable nature. It can change. It can shift. The way that I feel and the way that I express my gender can shift. And with gender fluidity, people can move across a spectrum of genders and be considered non-binary. It's not one or the other. Which conf confronts us with a really important question. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? And here's what's ironic about even that conversation and that question is these terms typically always rely on gender stereotypes. Gender stereotypes. And those shift from culture to culture and era to era. And you can go to the scriptures and you see this guy like King David and you're like, yeah, he's a warrior, he's a general, he's a king, but he also plays the harp and writes poetry and dances around half naked in front of his friends while he's praising God. <laughs> so what box does he fit into, Right? You can go to the scriptures and you can read stories about a woman who led the nation of Israel. Her name was Deborah, and she's a warrior who leads Israel in battle. She makes G.I. Jane look soft. And what, does, what box does she fit into? You have men in the scriptures who greet each other with a kiss, and you have women in the scriptures who kill enemies in battle. And so my point is, there is just a, there's a difference between gender and gender stereotypes. And what's ironic is we often use gender stereotypes in our current cultural moment to be the markers that we use to define gender when those are always shifting from culture to culture and generation to generation to begin with. So even that's not really a great boundary marker for us. And sometimes as a church, maybe this church and other churches, we propagate these radical gender stereotypes. And if you've ever felt that at Westbridge Church, I'm sorry, I'll take responsibility for that, especially if you're already struggling with your gender. I think we need to broaden our definitions of what it means to be male and female, that they don't have to follow strict gender stereotypes because there are some men who don't like big trucks and football, and there are some women who love powerlifting and axe throwing and steak and beer. <laughs> and that does not define your gender. And when gender and sex are separated from one another, that's what we're left with, is simply gender stereotypes that are often used to tell someone that they can change their gender, as opposed to relying on their biological sex to determine their gender. Which brings up our next term, gender dysphoria. This is a sense of mismatch between physical sex, your body, and psychological gender identity in your mind. Now this is, I can tell you, this is a very real thing. This is a very real thing. It, is, it affects a very, very small percentage of the population. But for those that it affects, it is incredibly real. And those wrestling with this feel that there is a war raging within them between their mind and their body. One testimony from a transgender person says this. It's like an electric current through my body that causes my joints to ache, my stomach to turn, my hands to shake, and nausea in the most severe moments of dysphoria. Laying in bed at night, it almost feels that the electric circuits in my body don't quite match up, like cramming two wrong puzzle pieces together. The BBC film Transgender Kids provides this definition. At the heart of the debate about transgender children is the idea that your brain can be at war with your body. It's a very real thing. And before we go any further, I just want you to just sit in that for just a moment. I want us to stop and just consider what that might feel like. So many people are quick to judge something that they don't have to deal with. But could we, as followers of Jesus, have enough empathy and compassion in this moment to recognize what an awfully difficult struggle that must be? To genuinely feel a disconnection, an incongruence, a dysphoria between what my body is telling me and what my mind is telling me. At the same time, and without wanting to diminish that particular struggle in any way. 
can we also be honest enough to admit that we all experience a battle between our mind and our body? That we all have a war going on internally. Followers of Jesus have always had a war going on between our minds and our bodies. The Apostle Paul would describe this battle in his letter to followers of Jesus living in the Roman Empire in the first century. And here's what he would say. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This is the Apostle Paul saying that his body is at war with his mind. I know what I should do, I don't do it. He says, there's the good that I want to do, and I don't do it. And the bad I know I shouldn't do, that's what I end up doing. In my mind, I know that I should do this, and I don't do it. The good I want to do, in my mind, I want to do this. I don't end up doing it in my body. The evil I don't want to do, in my mind, I keep on doing with my body. Paul would say, they are at war. This is a constant battle within me. And so, if there is anyone in the world who ought to have empathy and compassion for those facing gender dysphoria, it should be followers of Jesus. Because we all know what it is like to experience a war between our mind and our body. There is a war that takes place between my identity, who God declares me to be, and my behavior, my activity, the things that I do. Now, the final term to define for us today is this, transgender. This is just an umbrella term that uh, for many experiences of gender identity that do not align normatively with a person's biological sex. So anywhere along that, someone changes their pronouns, identifies as a different expression, somewhere along the spectrum of non-binary, uh, they would just transgender as this umbrella term that's become a movement in our culture. And it truly has, and I can say that with confidence because of the sheer number of people who are identifying as transgender at levels never seen in human history, unprecedented even a decade ago. And this brings us to the fundamental meaning of personhood and the challenge of answering this question. What then is a person? The cultural script would tell us one thing, and scripture would tell us something else. Now here's what you need to know. My role in this is to bring, here's what the scriptures teach, and do our best to interpret and contextualize the scriptures so that we can best follow Jesus. You don't have to agree with that. You might be here exploring, you might be found us on YouTube and you're watching online or whatever, and you don't have to agree in order to belong, in order to be accepted. But this is what we're going to talk about today is what is the difference between the message that culture is sending us and what do the scriptures teach? And how do we live that out? And so, here's the cultural view of personhood. The cultural view of personhood says, my mind is who I am as a person. In my mind, that, that defines me as a person. Body is just raw material with no moral value. And the two are separated from each other. There is a duality to that, that what I do in my mind doesn't affect my body and vice versa. Notice they're disconnected. The cultural view takes a very high view of the mind and a low view of the body. In other words, it's your mind that tells you who you really are, and your body is just a biological organism that may or may not be an impediment to your true happiness and fulfillment in life. So your body is there. If it happens to match up with your mind, great. But if not, then your body is just standing in the way of who you really are. Now here's what I want to do with the rest of our time together. I want to get to this question of personhood, the question of who you really are, by asking four questions. This is where we're going to go in the rest of the time we have together. Number one, what does God say about my body? Number two, what is the science telling us about our bodies in this current cultural moment? Three, how can we love well those who experience gender dysphoria? And four, if I'm experiencing gender dysphoria or I've already transitioned or I'm in that process, how can I find peace and happiness? And so let's start with this question, what does God say about my body? Here's what God says in the very first chapter of the Bible, in the creation story. This is the verse that Jesus himself, when questioned about uh, human sexuality and marriage, and he, this is the verse that he would go back to and quote from. It says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. And then a couple of verses later, God says this. Uh, it, it tells us that God looked over all that he had made and he saw that it was very good. 
Now let me point out a couple of observations about these verses. First, you and I were created intentionally in the image of God. So how we look is intentional and it matters. It was not by chance. Second, we are commissioned to steward creation and to multiply. So it says God created them male and female. It says be fruitful and multiply. Our bodies have a divine function and purpose. Third, we were created male and female, not simply as social constructs, not simply as a way to embrace current cultural, uh, you know, uh, gender stereotypes. But we were created male and female, set up by God to display something about God. We are imaging who God is. We are, we are reflecting the glory of God here on earth in the two different sexes, equal in value, but distinct in purpose and function. And the idea is that men and women together are created and intentionally designed beings who hold together and support God's temple of humanity. Not just men, not just women, but men and women are the full reflection of the image of God in the world. And God doesn't blur the difference between men and women. He elevates them. God gives our bodies and then he sets his image upon them. Preston Sprinkle, who is a pastor and sociologist, uh, works a lot extensively with the LGBTQ community. He says this, God could have created a sexless humankind to reflect his image, but he chose to create humans as sexed beings, male and female. So, what is God's view of personhood? God's view of personhood is this, that together our body, our mind, our body and soul are interconnected. They're interconnected. They're all one. And if there is, you know, this is why followers of Jesus have such a high view of the human body as created in the image of God. You were born in a body that was fearfully and wonderfully made by God and knit together in your mother's womb. Jesus entered into this world in a body taking on human flesh. When you put your faith in Jesus, your physical body is baptized and your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit living in you. And one day we are promised that we'll be resurrected to a new and glorified body. And so followers of Jesus have an incredibly high view of the body. The Apostle Paul would write this to followers of Jesus in Corinth in the first century. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And if there's anyone, if there's anyone who ever lived who could have empathy with feelings of dysphoria in your body, it would be Jesus. He was fully God in a human body. Think of the incongruence of that. If there's anyone who felt the limitations of a human body, it was Jesus. He has an incredible amount of compassion. He is not aloof to the feelings of incongruence or dysphoria that you or somebody you know and love may be walking through. And whatever those feelings are that you're experiencing or someone you love is experiencing, whatever that is, it is not from God, but whatever it is, you can bring it to God. And he understands. And yet, the cultural script keeps telling us we need to encourage people to take steps to listen to their mind and alter their body. If your mind and your body are at war, culture tells us, go with your mind and alter your body. Let's give you hormone blockers and puberty blockers, and let's do chest binding and gender reassignment surgery. And this has become a movement, and we simply must acknowledge that right now, especially in Gen Z. The numbers are skyrocketing. An estimated 20% of Gen Z now identify as LGBTQ, and it's predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly among young teenage girls. Abigail Schreier is an Ivy League educated, non-Christian, sociologist, journalist, and researcher. She says transgenderism among adolescents right now is contagious. In her words, it's become an epidemic, and it's spread primarily by two means. Immense social media immersion, especially TikTok, and relationships. That young adolescent girls want a sense of identity and worth and they want to be celebrated and they view it as a way to receive affirmation and inclusion. So we've got to ask this question. What is the science telling us about this? Our culture has dived in head first with acceptance and affirmation of this ideology. The thinking is if we accept someone's new gender expression, 
that if we fully affirm their gender expression and we alter their body to align with their mind, that their mental health will improve and the odds of suicidal thoughts and ideation goes way down. That if we could just get their body in line with their mind, that they will be happier, that they will be at peace, that they will be more fulfilled, that they will experience the contentment that they've been longing for. But is this happening? Is aligning your body to your mind really helping people? In the United Kingdom, there's a trans activist organization that has released statistics that reveal that among the trans and non-binary, uh, among trans and non-binary people, 42% have considered suicide and 20% have attempted it. That's heartbreaking. Those numbers are extremely high. Logic would tell us these numbers should be dropping by encouraging people to align their body with their mind. And what's startling is that these stats are not dropping. When you look at countries that are more affirming than we are and have been moving in that direction for much longer than the United States, Sweden and the United Kingdom and the Netherlands, many of these countries are now shutting down their clinics. In Sweden, transition surgeries have been done for more than 50 years, and yet in 2022, it was announced that all gender-related treatment for minors would be shut down because they weren't seeing improved results in their patients and their mental health. England just recently closed the, the Tavistock Clinic, which was the number one clinic in all of the United Kingdom for transgender uh, and, uh, and gender transformation surgeries. And an independent national review found this. The current model of care was leaving young people at considerable risk of poor mental health and distress. In Amsterdam, the center of expertise on gender dysphoria put out a study that found that 65% to 94% of trans teens ceased to identify as trans teens by the time they reach young adulthood. They ceased to identify as trans. In other words, it's a phase for 65% to 94% and eventually they phase out of it. Now this is huge because if that's the case, then it's just cruel if we're urging teens to make a decision that will alter their body for a lifetime while the vast majority will phase out of it later in life. What we're doing is we're, we're telling teenagers, we're telling sometimes 11, 12, 13 year olds to make life altering decisions. And there's very little talk about all of the side effects and so many people get to the other side and the reason the numbers are going up is because the very thing that was promised to give them fulfillment and happiness and peace isn't delivering. And they end up worse off than ever. Dr. Paul McHugh is a psychiatrist at John Hopkins University and Hospital. Here's a quote from him. He says this, treatment should not be directed at the body as with surgery and hormones any more than one treats obesity and anorexic patients with liposuction. The treatment should strive to correct the false problematic nature of the assumption. Well, let me point out, the science in all of this is not coming from sources that are operating with a Christian worldview. For 50 years, they have not seen the patient's mental health improving by altering the body to align with the mind. In other words, it's not producing the good and the peace and the contentment and the fulfillment that the cultural script has promised. And as followers of Jesus, we must be compassionate people who lead with love and grace. But we also must lead from a place of truth as we seek the good of people who are deeply burdened and hurting over a feeling of incongruence within their body. Truth without love is so damaging. If all we do is deliver truth and there's no love and there's no grace, it's so damaging. At the same time, you cannot love well without truth. So, while the cultural script says, listen to your mind and change your body, Scripture says something entirely different. Here's what the Apostle Paul would write to followers of Jesus. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies, give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. And then he continues and says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think in your mind. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, when the mind and body are out of alignment, culture says, listen to your mind and change your body. 
But God says when your mind and body are out of alignment, you embrace the body God gave you and you allow him and his power to transform and renew your mind. You begin to, to bring your mind into alignment with what God says about your body. Now, if that feels alarming to you and you feel like that, that's just not going to work, we just need to affirm people, can I just ask you this question? Isn't this the way that we treat every other medical issue? For instance, imagine you have a 90-pound teenage daughter who struggles with anorexia and you love her with all your heart and she goes to the doctor and says, Doctor, when I look at my body, my mind says I'm overweight. No loving, well-informed doctor would say, well, if that's what your mind is telling you, then let's put you on diet pills and let's do liposuction and let's do gastric bypass surgery. Since your mind doesn't match the reality of your body, let's change your body so it lines up with your mind. No. A good and loving doctor would help this child of God begin to transform her mind to embrace the reality of her body. Now let me ask this question. What should a parent do? How do we love well people who find themselves experiencing this dysphoria? What if I'm a parent and my teenager comes to me and says, this is how I feel and I want to change. And their child says that I'm transgender or I'm non-binary. I want you to hear this loud and clear. If you're a parent, first and foremost, love your son, love your daughter. First and foremost, love them, love them, love them. Don't abandon them in that struggle. If anything, move closer to them. Uh, like you may not agree with every belief or behavior in their life, but they should never, ever, ever for a single second doubt your love for them. They should never, ever doubt your loyalty to them. You create a safe place for them. You, you create security for them. What our world needs from the church is a lot less outrage and a lot more outrageous love. And we are committed to creating a place for you to thrive here at Westbridge. Now, second, if you're a parent in this situation, can I encourage you? Wait. Wait. Be patient. Don't immediately affirm a new gender and change their pronouns and, uh, you know, alter their body. Don't immediately put them on puberty blockers. Love them through it. Lean into them and love them through it. But also, if I was a parent in that situation, I would wait. Now, there's two sides of this conversation. Some people say, well, I've been told this a lot. If you don't love me, if you don't fully accept me and affirm everything I do, then you don't love me. We've done a massive disservice to people on both sides of this conversation in our culture by equating love and agreement. The two are not the same thing. I have a lot of friends who I disagree with on a lot of things. And I don't always agree with my kids, but I love them. And there are things that we tell our kids because we love them. We tell them no because we love them. And your kid can't go to you and go, well, I want to eat ice cream for dinner every day. No. Well, if you, don't, if you don't fully accept that for me and agree with me and affirm that decision that I'm making in my life as a 13-year-old, then you don't love me. That is just not true. Love and agreement are not the same thing. And people have told me, if I don't agree with and affirm both their belief and their behavior, that is unloving. That is just not intellectually honest. How many times as parents have we said no to our kids precisely because we do love them? And we recognize that in the moment, they may not like us very much, but we're doing what is in their best interest long term. That is the definition of love. Now let me just say this. There's, there's, there's arguments to be made on both sides of like, what if somebody has specific pronouns that they want you to use with them? If it was my child, and, and I already have a good relationship with them, I'd have to wrestle through that. I can tell you this, there's, there's valid conversations on both sides about, is it, is it integrity to use a pronoun that doesn't match their biological sex? Am I somehow affirming them? And then, on the other side of it is this. You need to know that most people who struggle with gender dysphoria or who have transitioned or who identify by a different pronoun, if you call them by the pronoun that they ask you to call them by, most of them do not see that as you fully affirming their decision. They just see it as courteous and polite. And at the end of the day, my, my goal with anybody who is in that position is that I want to build a friendship because I want to point them to Jesus. Now, there's a case to be made on both sides, and you have to navigate that and wrestle through that. But can I just suggest that we seek to understand where they're coming from before we make that decision? 
and that we let love be the guiding ethic for us? See, if our friendship in the body of Christ is rooted in agreement in all things, then that's a very fragile friendship. What marks followers of Jesus is our ability to love well, even when, and especially when, we don't see eye to eye. And finally, if you've gone down this road, maybe you've already transitioned, you love somebody who has, or you've got a teenager at home wrestling with gender dysphoria, or, or I'm describing you, and you might be sitting here in this seat right now or watching online, and you're feeling overwhelmed, and maybe you're just thinking this, man, you've thrown a lot of Bible verses and a lot of statistics my way, and my head is swirling, and I'm just trying to make sense of all this. And honestly, I couldn't care less about American politics, and I just want to be happy. That's what's motivating me. And I just want the war to end, and I just want to be at peace, and I just want to know if I can be loved, and if God sees me, and if God has a a hope for me, and a plan, and a future for me. And I want you to hear me clearly. The answer to that question is unequivocally yes. Yes. Yes, you can be loved. Yes, you can be received by God. Yes, God does see you. Yes, God does have a purpose and a future for your life. In Acts chapter 8, the Holy Spirit comes to a guy named Philip, and he tells Philip to pack an overnight bag and start walking towards Gaza. And he's out there, leaves the city of Jerusalem. He's out on the road. He's about 60 miles outside of Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit is is setting up this divine appointment between Philip and a man from Ethiopia who is known as a eunuch. Now, a eunuch was someone whose genitals had been cut, crushed, or pierced in order to sterilize and feminize. They were often servants that served in royal palaces, and they didn't want them dealing with anything in terms of sexuality, so they just would do this. They would either castrate them or pierce or crush or cut. And the text tells us this guy was from the capital city of Ethiopia, which is a thousand miles away from Jerusalem. How in the world is this guy here in the middle of the desert? And he makes this trek to Jerusalem because he wants to visit the temple, which is where the presence of God can be found. And in Acts chapter 8, he's returning back to Ethiopia, and he's dejected, and he's rejected, because historians tell us when he reached the temple in Jerusalem, this would have been the sign that he would have seen on the outside of the temple. No lame, no diseased, no blind, and no eunuchs may enter. Now, I I want you to imagine for a second that whatever it is your particular struggle is, is on this sign. I want you to imagine you show up to Westbridge Church and you struggle with something else, but you have a struggle and you show up to the church and on the outside of the church it says, whatever that particular struggle is that you deal with, not allowed here. That's what he experienced. As he shows up to the temple and he's traveled a thousand miles pursuing God and he was turned away by the supposed people of God that I I would imagine he questioned it. Does God really love me? because some of the people who claim to represent him have stiff-armed me and have shamed me and shunned me away from him. And he's heading back home, and the Holy Spirit sends this guy Philip after him. And when Philip finds him, the eunuch is on the side of the road, and he's reading from an Old Testament scroll. He's reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, a scroll from the prophet Isaiah. And he's about to read Isaiah 53. And in that same scroll, just a couple of chapters later, he would have come across these words in Isaiah chapter 56. He would have read this. Don't let the eunuchs say, I'm a dried up tree with no children and no future. This is God speaking. Don't let the eunuchs say that about themselves. For this is what the Lord says. I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath days holy and who choose to do what pleases me and commit their lives to me. I will give them within the walls of my temple. Think about how big this is. Think about how huge this is for someone who was just told they can't enter the temple. And he would have read this. I will give them within the walls of my temple a memorial and a name far greater than sons and daughters could give. For the name I give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. Imagine a a eunuch going, I could never have kids. My my name is going to disappear, and I can't even, I'm I'm not even allowed in the temple. And then God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to give you a name that will never disappear. In fact, it's going to be a memorial inside the walls of that very temple. So he travels a thousand miles to the temple, and he saw the sign keeping him out, and he's reminded of the scars and the wounds of his crushed and pierced body. And he's thinking, because of these scars, I can never enter into the presence of God. And then he reads these words out of Isaiah chapter 53. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. And by his wounds, we are healed. 
And just as he's leaving Jerusalem, rejected and dejected, God loves him so much that he sends Philip after him to find him on the side of the road and to say to him, your scars do not define you. His scars do. His scars define you. So please hear me. Whatever it is that you're experiencing, whatever it is that you're walking through, whatever scars you're carrying, whether physical scars or emotional scars, if you're wondering if there is a hope for you and a future for you, I want you to know God declares through his Holy Spirit that you are a child of the living God. You are his son, you are his daughter, and you have been given an identity, and you've been given a body, and you've been given a place and a purpose in God's family because only Jesus gets to tell you who you are. And he says, you are loved. And if you're transgender, if you're experiencing gender dysphoria, or you know somebody who is, and you love them, and you care for them, I want you to know what kind of a church you've walked into today. I want you to know what kind of a church you've stumbled across on YouTube. You walked into a church where you will never, ever see a sign up front that says that you're not welcome. We will love you, and we will serve you, and we will honor you, and we will have empathy for you, and we will not shame you, or shun you, or judge you, or marginalize you, or talk down to you. We will speak with a gentle tone from a place of grace and truth as we invite you into the same journey that the rest of us are on, being transformed by the renewing of our minds to become more like Jesus. And here's why. What is more beautiful and liberating and a joyful place to live from? For you to live with the pressure to decide who you are or for you to claim who God died for you to be and to live the identity that God declares for you. You are not who you say you are. You are not who I say you are. You are not who others say you are. You're not who society says you are. You are who God says you are. That is such a free place to live in. And the invitation that is extended to every one of us is to simply step into that identity and live it out. See, Jesus, fully God, became human. He showed up in the world in a human body. And then he allowed his body to be put to death. He he did that willingly, laying down his life in self-sacrificial love. And then the scriptures tell us that when he went to that cross and died, that he took our sin and our shame and our brokenness and he crucified it with him. He took that and he put it to death. And then his body, his dead body was laid in a tomb. And according to multiple eyewitness accounts, hundreds of people saw Jesus rise from the dead. Which means if Jesus has the power over death, he has the power over the things that are bringing death to you and me. That means there's more to this life than this life. And you and I have been invited to be a part of God's family forever. And you do not behave your way into it. You you don't earn your way in or church attend your way in. It's simply an invitation from the God of the universe who created you and who loves you. And you have been invited. Every person who has ever drawn breath has been invited by this God. And if you've never said yes to that, you're invited. So I want to invite you, whether you're here in the room or watching online, you can say yes by agreeing with this simple prayer as we close. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for the times I've walked away from you and I'm so thankful you never walk away from me. And I pray, make me your son, make me your daughter. I wanna say yes to your invitation to be a part of your family and help me to put my trust in you and to follow you as best as I know how from this moment on. And God, I pray for every one of us who are followers of Jesus, who've already said yes to your grace. The reality is that until we receive a resurrected body, there's always going to be a war raging between our mind and our body. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to lean in and let your Holy Spirit renew our minds, that we would offer our our bodies, our actions to you, and that you would renew our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. And more than anything, God, I pray that you would help us to be people who love well. And may the love that we show others point them to you, to your grace. We pray this in your name. Amen.